Thank you guys so much for coming this morning. You know, I, this week was a busy, 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 busy week for me. I didn't know if I was coming or going all week. And, uh, but I finally finished the sermon and did a lot of thinking about this one, a lot of praying, because this is a subject that is more of a technical subject than it is a... Uh, uh, really, than it is anything, and I, I want people to understand that, you know, when you're talking about different things, whenever I speak up here, it's funny how everybody takes different parts and pieces of a sermon, and they go away with one little piece when they don't look at the whole thing, and, uh, and I, I really, when I'm talking about this, don't remember one little piece here, uh, don't go away getting angry because I said one little piece in there that you're upset with or you don't agree with, take the whole thing in general. Take the whole thing, what I've got to say. Because I truly believe what I'm saying. This is what God put on my heart. And uh, so let's, we'll just dig right in. First thing I want us to talk about is the Sabbath day of the Old Testament is on Saturday. Okay? The Sabbath day is on Saturday. And if we look at our calendar, I'm not getting into the whole technical. I'm not going to sit here and go into the, the mathematics and everything else of what the seventh day really is and when it really is. There's even a thing out there saying that there was actually eight days in a calendar and some things. And I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there. And I could sit up here and do a whole, I don't know what you say, the theological thing about that alone. But I'm not. I want you to understand the Sabbath day is the seventh day of the week. Period. That's the day of rest. Doesn't matter anything else. Of the Ten Commandments, this is one that many people take the lightest. They take it lightly, both Christians and non-Christians. And, and I really want you to think about all the commandments. I mean, they, there was Ten Commandments, but there was a bunch of laws in the Old Testament that were given. Okay, hear what I'm saying? They were a bunch of laws. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are the commandments. But there was laws along with these commandments to help you get along, to help you work things out. So remember all that as we talk on here. Because nothing, and when you come to this, people always say, well, back up, sorry. That it seems that this one commandment, the Sabbath, is... No big deal. It's not, it's not a, one that God was that worried about. Nothing could be further from the truth. All right? This is dealing with man's relationship with God. That's what this Sabbath is all about. It concludes all that we need to know in order to have a full life. All the commandments are needed for a full life. Indeed, I'm not going to say they're not. God's rightful place and man's rightful place cannot be understood in life without his commandments. The commandments and all together, are, they are part, they are, they, we are wrapped into those. But the commandment that I'm talking about, the Sabbath, really has two parts to it. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Six days shall you work. We cannot find meaning in work without worship. And worship without work has no practical value at all. And, and when I say that, it, some people go, well, that doesn't make sense. And as, if you listen to the whole thing and you listen to the end, you're going to understand what that really means. It is the combination of both work, worship and work that creates a full humanity and a purpose of life. You know, I've been told, you know, I work because I want to make money. Well, I work because I want to be God. Okay? And, 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 I, and I really want you to think about it along those lines. If our work is ourselves and it has nothing else with it, if we're doing it for ourselves and that's it, it's not going to last. If we don't have a sense of purpose. We cannot experience work as a joyous thing without realizing that our work is being done for something greater than ourselves. And worship without work gives no expression of God's power in our lives. The Bible teaches us that to experience the fullness of humanity, we must both consistently worship God and work the way we're supposed to for Him. 
With that being said, I want to talk about why we have church on Sunday and how to honor the fourth commandment, which is the Sabbath under the New Testament law. Now, I really, before we dig deep into it, I want to give you an understanding of how God felt or feels about the Sabbath. This is something that is very important to God. But I want you to look at it the last day, and not as a need of rest. Because I really want you to think about this. When this says a need of rest, how many people in here actually believe that God had to rest? I mean, we all know Isaiah, the book of Isaiah tells us that God does not need that. That's not his need. It wasn't a need to rest. Now, don't get me wrong, it's said that way, and, and I want you to understand. Because the need to rest isn't something I believe God needed. God didn't need rest. He gave it to us for us, for our day. God was saying, it's complete. I've done these six things that's complete. Here's the seventh day. Enjoy it, basically. I mean, think about it along those lines. Look forward to your complete week so that you can start a new week anew. A new, all starting over. That day was given to us for us, and I want you to remember that as I talk about this, this is the Sabbath. That's what it's about, okay? It is an important day to God. It is important that we remember it's important to God. It is important that we follow it. It's important. God tells his people in Exodus 16 how important it is. He tells them how he doesn't want them to forget it. He tells them how he will give them their needs if they recognize it. And he tells them that he will honor those who honor it. And I'm going to read Exodus here. So in a second, Exodus 16. Doesn't this day almost seem more than just another day? And, and more than just a day, if you really concentrate on this. Exodus 16, starting with 29. They must realize that the Sabbath is the Lord's gift to you. That is why he gives you a two-day supply on the sixth day. So there will be enough for two days. On the Sabbath day, you must each stay in your place. Do not go out to pick up food on the seventh day. So the people did not gather any food on the seventh day. Now, if you read this, go back to this area. And you read this area, it's kind of cool because you see the people, again, not believing in God. Because God is what he gave them man. And I don't know if anybody remembers the man apart, but the God, the, they were grumbling and complaining. You know, we're going to starve in the desert. Even though God led us all the way through this, did all this to get us to point A, these people are going, oh, there's no God. We're going to starve. And God says, oh, golly, let me tell you something. Let me give you food. So he gives them food. And he gives them rules behind this food. <coughs> Excuse me. And he tells them that, you know, don't keep it overnight. Don't keep it more one night. It'll go bad and blah, blah, blah. And there's more to it. <coughs> more to it than just that. And then he tells them that on this sixth day, gather enough for two days so you don't have to work on the Sabbath. Well, first of all, there's something to do with the man. I mean, I'm not getting into all that, that I can go into more detail. Um, but I, I really want you to understand what he's telling them here. Take it easy on the seventh day. Relax. Have faith that you'll have enough to get you through. Have faith. And, and, and that's really, if you look at what he's saying, he's testing their faith. Because when they didn't do what he told them, that molded, it got maggots, it got all kinds of stuff, it, it really messed things up. So, I mean, think about this. What he's doing is testing their faith. Do you have faith that I'll provide? Do you have faith that I'll give you rest? Do you have faith I'll take care of your needs? Do you have faith that I will sustain you? Do you have faith to know that I've got this? That's what he's telling them there. He's really, he's, he's kind of pounded it into them. And, and when you understand that how important this Sabbath is, it doesn't mean we need to change our time of worship and stuff like that. Because it's on Saturday. No, that's not what I'm saying. I really want you to, in order to better understand why I'm saying, no, you don't have to change it to Saturday, I, I really want you to, to hear how it keeps going out here. I believe we need to understand the laws of the Old Testament a little better. Yes, that's including the Ten Commandments. 
In particular, the one we're talking about right now, the Sabbath. Because if you read in Exodus 16, it gives us that right here. It says, remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But on the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. This includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living among you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and everything in it. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Now I'm not up here kind of telling you or making fun or making light of the seventh day. By no means. I'm not saying we don't need to honor it. I want you to hear my words and hear exactly what I'm saying about this fourth commandment. What I want you to do is get specific here. Those of you who feel that you need to honor the seventh day the way the Old Testament tells us, the way the Jewish law is there, and you need to honor it, then by all means, I tell you, honor it. Do it. Okay? But if you're going to do it, you've got to do all the laws. You've got to do everything. Everything that they're up there telling you to do, and that means you can't even pick a stick up on that day. You can't leave more than so many feet from your house. But not only that, there's other laws. There's the eating laws, the food laws. You can't eat certain food. And, and if you really want to get all into that, and you really want to get down to that, then you need to honor it all. If you're actually wanting to feel that calling that God's put that on your heart to follow the laws of the Jews, then I implore you to do it. Don't allow me or anybody else to stop. Just remember, that means following all the laws. That doesn't mean you can do 55 or 60 in a 55 mile an hour zone because you're not following the law. That doesn't mean that because other people are doing it, you can do it. That means do it. The law is specific on how to follow it. And I listed several of them up there. I'm not reading through all of them, but I did particularly like the last three. Don't do your own pleasure. Don't speak your own words. Don't think your own thoughts. I like those. Because I want you to keep those three in mind. Because there's something that that goes along with really well. And you're going to see that as we go on here. Because this commandment is a commandment. And I don't know of anyone who truly follows it to the letter. I don't even think the Jews of the time follow it to the letter. But uh, am I saying that I'm not... I'm not Lord, I'm not knocking this commandment because it is a true commandment of God. So don't think I'm not. But before, and, I, and it's funny how so many people will look at it and they'll judge the Christians who worship on Sunday and they need to, to, to do the law itself. They need to understand this law. You'll hear them say that. Well, I, I have to say a verse that probably is kind of touchy here, but I feel they need to take the plank out of their eye before they look at the speck in somebody else's. Because if you look at it this way, the Lord God created the entire world new. That's what it was about. It was a new world, a new thing, right? And he took this day, this day of to celebrate that creation, to worship it. That's what it's about, to worship the God that created it all. That's what this was about. Because if you read Colossians 2.13, and that's where it's really focused on here. You were dead because of your sin and because your sinful nature was not yet uh, cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for He forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. And this way, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by His victory over them on the cross. Jesus changed it all, people. He is the one that gave us a new life. He took our punishment and the old life and the labor that we had and the pains and he cleansed them. Jesus publicly stood up against these rulers and authorities. What they said was blasphemy. He proved that he was the truth, that he is the truth. He showed them it isn't in their interpretation of the law that people are saved. There is only one way to be saved. And that's through Jesus Christ himself. Amen. He is the only way. In his life, we have rest and a future. 
Because if you read on, verse 18, it says, I think that's 18, maybe 15. But, so don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. Christ himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. Did you hear what it said there? For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come to come. And Christ himself is that reality. When you hear that, it isn't doing away with the Sabbath. It is reinforcing the true Sabbath. It is the celebration of the true rest. Jesus is our rest, people. He is the one that we live in. Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. He is our Sabbath. The shadow of the reality yet to come. I love it. I, and if you really look at it, our true rest is in the only one, the Savior. The Sabbath was given to us for rest, and now we have true rest in Him. Jesus is the seventh day of creation. All was complete in Him. Everything. Genesis 2 says, So the creation of heavens and earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God finished his work of creation. So he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. Because it was the day when he rested from all his work. You know, keeping it holy. Having rest. Here in a second, we're going to hear from Jesus and how he feels about this himself. But I want you to look at a common sense real quick thing here. Isn't this kind of the one first commandment that God gave us? It, it wasn't written down on tablets right there. But he was telling us it is that time. It is to have holy. Set it aside. But if you think about this now, when he gave this commandment, he was giving it to Adam and Eve people. Where did they live? They lived in a perfect world. Did they work? Did they have jobs? They didn't have any of that. God gave it to us. And, and, I, and I really, look at it along those lines. It was brand new. It was, it was everything. They weren't toiling in the yard or anything like that. They didn't need that rest. That type of rest that we're talking about that people look at. I don't see this so much as being a tired rest, because I guarantee you, God, like I said, didn't need the rest. It was a day for us, so that we could take a chill, and we could praise the one that we're supposed to worship, the new one, the, our God. It was for a work well done. If you think of it as that true rest, something that gives us a true rest, Think about Jesus here. Seriously. Because in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, this is what he says. My Father has entrusted everything to me. No one truly knows the Son except the Father. And no one truly knows the Father except the Son. And those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. When Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. To bear and the burden I give you is light. Did you hear it? God trusted us with the people. Including the day given to us. Jesus is our rest people. I believe once again, God knows better than we do. He knows that we need that. He knew that the rest that we need was for our souls. He had no doubt. Yeah, we need physical rest. I'm not going to say we don't. God's calling us to do that. Every one of us needs rest. 
But I'm telling you, if you look at the common sense factor here, 100% common sense, when you're tired, you're mentally tired. When you're mentally tired, you cannot tell me that you do not get physically tired. They're one and the same. When you get so this week, when you don't trust God, what happens? I know there's a couple people here I talk to about this quite often. Because they don't trust God. They worry too much. They worry about everything under the moon. When you worry and you don't have faith in God and you don't trust God, what happens? You start getting tired. Your body gets tired. You mentally just, you're broken down. Then you're physically, you get broken down. When you turn to the true rest of Jesus Christ and you give it to Him, you should find rest. When you recognize it, we must strengthen our relationship with Jesus. Hold the Holy One holy. Our true rest. As we continue to read in Colossians, it goes on and it says, And they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with his joints and ligaments, and it grows, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ, and you have and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of the world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but... They provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Jesus helps us conquer our desires, people. I truly believe if you were convicted to follow the traditions of the old law, you better do it. There's some reason God put it on your heart. The problem is today people want to pick and choose the laws they want to follow. And I'm not just talking about the laws of the Old Testament. I'm talking about Jesus' words. So many people want to look at things and say, hey, Jesus said that, but you know that was a different culture, different time. The problem is, you can't do that. What the things are saying you must believe is what they are. Have you been saved? It is amazing when I hear people tell me and say things along the lines of, and I just sat next to a guy on a plane the other day. Great guy. Enjoyed talking to him. Made the flight go by a lot faster. And it was a while back, but it made the flight go by a whole lot faster. And it's funny because I asked him if he was a Christian. You know, we got to talking about it. And uh, he goes, oh, yeah, I'm a Christian. He goes, I used to be a Buddhist. But I don't, I, you know, I, I, I got away from the Buddhist faith. And I really believe in Jesus. And I said, yeah. I said, because I said, Jesus is the only way. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. He is. And, and then in the middle of the conversation, we got to talk about some other religion. And he goes, yeah, they're good people. But, you know, they'll be there with us. And I, and I literally, it was like a double take. You know, what, what do you mean they, they'll be there with us? You know, I, I, I don't get that. I, I, and, I, and that's why I asked him. I said, I said, I, I, you just said that you were a Christian. The only, the only way was through Jesus Christ. But now you're telling me that, and I'm not going to, I don't care. He was, he was talking about Muslims. And, uh, and I was like, I don't understand how, I don't understand how you're getting that they're going to be there with us with Jesus. That they don't believe the way they're supposed to. And so, well, you know, as long as you have God in your heart, and I was like, well, I, I agree. If God, Jesus is in your heart, you're, you're saved. And, you know, if you take Jesus as your Savior, if you've been baptized, and, and, and you're following his path, I, I agree. And I said, well, I don't see what you're in. And we went back and forth, and I know by the end he was kind of upset with me, but I, I, I really wanted him to understand that if you really believe and you really are a Christian, you can't nitpick and, and pick and choose. Because bottom line is, no one's good enough. No one. We are all bad and sinners and destined for hell. You need to tell your friends that. You need to tell everybody you know that. And tell them that the only way to get past that, or to get over that, or however you want to say it, is through Jesus Christ. Christ. If you do not have Jesus in your life, you do not focus on Jesus, if you do not hold Him holy above all else, you are not going to see the Father. 
It doesn't matter any other way that you see it or want to believe it. That is the only way. But the problem is we want to be touchy-feely and we're scared that we're going to hurt our friends' feelings because we're telling them that the religion they're in is going to send them to hell. And the sad part is, I ask you, is, is that what we're supposed to do? We're not. And if you're not preaching it, talking about it, living it, you and your friends are going to be in the same spot. And I don't want to be there. I want to see you with me. The only one person in this world that can fill all the laws of Jesus. And because he did, we get to live an eternity of the life with God. Now I ask you, if he fulfilled all the laws, what does that really mean? Does it just mean that he kept them and didn't break him? I want you to understand, when it says fulfill the laws, yes, he didn't break any of the laws. He lived a perfect life, but yet he healed on the Sabbath. He plucked wheat and ate on the Sabbath. He did stuff on the Sabbath. So if he fulfilled all the laws, if you really get to the point and understand what the fulfilling of the laws meant, you need to understand that what that meant was everything that was predicted, everything that they said, everything that was lived. He lived the perfect life. Anything that was said that he'd be done, it was done. He, he, he totally lived it. Yes, he obeyed all the laws. Because if you read on Matthew 12, this is where we start getting a little understanding a little better. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the scripture what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went to the house of God. And he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on the duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? I tell you, there is one here who is even greater than the temple. But you would not have condemned my innocent disciples if you knew the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifice, for the Son of Man is Lord, even over the Sabbath. He is Lord, even over the Sabbath. He is the Sabbath, people. We have to honor Him in all we do. When we work, we do so for Him. When we worship, we do so for Him. When we rest, we do so in Him. We are to keep Him holy. That means keep our thoughts in Him. Focus on Him. To keep our life in the light of Him. He is the light. So why do we have church on Sundays and not Saturdays? Well, I'm going to read you a list. And you can mark these scriptures down. It's a big list, so I'm reading kind of fast here. Feel free. First, Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Not on the Sabbath. Mark 16, 9. All six appearances of Jesus happened on Sundays. None on the Sabbath. And I've got a list of scriptures there. It's Mark 16, 9, Matthew 28, and Luke 24. That's just a couple of them. Christians are recorded assembling three times on Sunday after resurrection and before ascension. Never on the Sabbath. John 20, 19, John 20, 26, and Acts 2, 1. Now, anyway, I'm going to go on and keep reading the list. The only time Christians are recorded to have assembled together was on Sunday in Acts 27. Doesn't ever show them assembling on the Sabbath. The only day ever mentioned when Christians broke bread was on Sunday, Acts 20, 7. Christians are commanded every Sunday to give into a communion treasury of the church, 1 Corinthians 16. Jesus was declared the Son of God on Sunday, Romans 1, 4. 
Today I have begotten thee was fulfilled on Sunday when he rose, which is Acts 13, 33. So by the way, that was a prediction in, back in Psalm 2, 7. But anyway, the sign that Jesus was glorified was given on Sunday, both in John 7, 39 and Acts 2. The church officially began on Pentecost Sunday, which is Acts 2. Jesus was crowned king on Sunday in Acts 2. The disciples' reception of the promises of the Father was on Sunday, Acts 1 and in Acts 2. The Holy Spirit first fell upon the apostles on Sunday, which is Acts 3. I'm sorry. That's Acts 2. Salvation was first preached by Peter on Sunday in Matthew 16 and in Acts 2. The key of the kingdom of God was first used on Sunday, which was Matthew 16. The great triumphal entry happened on the first day, which was Psalm, Psalm Sunday, it's thir Luke 13. The time between the Lord's resurrection of Pentecost was Sunday to Sunday, 50 days between them. The starting and stopping time was the first day. The first time Jesus worshipped after resurrection was on the first day in John 20. The first time Jesus had communion after his resurrection with his disciples was on Sunday, Luke 24. Pentecost was a Sunday. And I'm sure there's so many more. And I know that list may have drawn out, but I, I just wanted to make a point to understand that what was all found on those days. The key is, I want you to focus here, is the Sabbath is not Sunday. Repeat, it's not Sunday. The Jewish or the Old Testament law of Sabbath is the seventh day. And if you believe that, then honor it. If you don't, if you believe that, that Jesus is the one that will give you rest, that the day of worship we need to follow in his footstep. All the stuff you look at there, Jesus did on Sunday after his new world, after Jesus made everything new again, everything was done on Sunday. It was new. I believe the laws were made to give us a better moral compass. I have no doubt. Understand how to live like Jesus. They were made to protect us from evil and guide us to God. We now have Jesus for that. He came so we no longer have to live in the shadows of the law, but in the light of Jesus. And as for nitpicking the laws on the Sabbath, I think Jesus made it clear in all those verses. And like I've said so many times, if you start focusing on God, you won't have to worry about whether or not you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. Once you put the focus on Him, you'll know the truth. And the truth is in Jesus. And only through repentance and baptism and the change of your life will you ever get to see the glory of God. Period. And I, and, and I know this is a subject that many people will look at and, and there may be a couple things there you don't agree with. And Well, this is what God put in my heart. And Jesus has said it many times to all those followers, all those guys, all those people in the Sahedrin and all those that when you start nitpicking everything to death, you start losing the true focus. And the true focus is God. And, and the, that's what people like to do today. Is they want to find one point that they can hammer somebody on. Instead of looking at the whole thing as a whole. And, 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 and that's, that's the problem, okay? If you look at the Bible as a whole, the book of love. But I can tell you right now, I can show you many, many places in the book that God hates. God says he despises. And you can have a map and you can start having people debate you about, well, how can the guy that loves hate? That's what I mean. If you take it as a book from the front to the back, you will know that God does hate things that takes his love away from us. He loves each and every one of us. And he wants us to hold it upright to his son as holy 
and true. And when you start focusing on his son, all this stuff that we talk about, these little peddling things that people like to split churches over, like I've preached in the past, you're going to find that it doesn't matter. But the thing is, so many people just want to focus on what they think, what they want out of it. And they don't want to focus on what the whole place needs. And I'll tell you right now, every one of us needs God. We need the Savior. Because if you don't have the Savior, you'll never find the rest of heaven. You'll always be coming to something other than the true Savior. Yes. You know, I, I hope and pray that what you got out of this message is more than Sunday, Saturday, Sabbath, and all that arguing. I hope that you understand that God gave us a day of rest in the Old Testament. That's the shadow of the old. The new light is Jesus. He is our rest. He is the one that we love. He's the one that we honor. So if you don't know Jesus, and you don't know what it's like to have him, real rest. Come up here. Meet Jesus. And tell me. And Jesus, it's, you, can't, you can't even imagine how much worry get wiped away, how much fretting gets wiped away, and how much your soul is shocked. Now's the time. Come on up.